we are on, on time. Hello, everybody. Um, this is the first part of the Waka practical, so theory time over now. Um, this, I already see lots of notebooks. This is exactly how I want to have it. Yeah, right? um, in principle, what, I go, what I'm going to tell you is now, in the first part, actually, how am I going to install Orca on a system? Now, roughly what many of you have been doing, or something has been done to your computer before. Um, this is if you have to do it all by yourself. Uh, and afterwards, how do I write my input script for Orca? How do I get my molecule into Orca? And how do I start my first calculations? And then I will continue with, let's say, what is between good practice and common wisdom. Uh, this means if you ever saw a paper with theoretical results, you see maybe 20 different functionals and let's say 200 different basis sets. And if you are new to the field, you just wonder what the heck, which one do I take if I really want to start my own calculations? How do I, can I even evaluate these properties? Uh, and this is something I'm going to tell you right now. Followed up with a small session where you are all invited to actually follow the stuff at your computer with a small example how to start common tasks. Uh, right, so this is the plan for the next, let's say, one and a half hours, two hours. Afterwards, the real Orca practical starts with the um, yeah, problems stated in the PDF file on your sticks. Uh, so yeah, you can work then on those problems presented there. At that point, you will have lots of people here who can assist you with both, let's say, the installation and also with the problems. And you will recognize these people, they will have a yellow badge. Right? You all have some nice shiny looking badge. And if there's some yellow badge, this means there's a Waka tutor who is able to help you with your problems if you encounter any. Um, you might also see some yellow uh, blue badges um, this guy you might also ask, but depending if you end up with a professor, maybe not. Um, so in principle, it's possible to ask these people with different color badges. Okay, so far. A few remarks up in front still. This summer school is made for you. Meaning, the more you participate yourself, the more you will get out of it. So if you just sit there and consume everything that's being said, fine. But that's not the way we want to have it. We want to have that you actually say, okay, what's this? How can I do something with a calculation with my systems? How can I solve my problems? And if I encounter problems, go to some guy who with a yellow badge and say, hey, how can I do this and that? Help me. And this is how we want to have it. Take an active part here and let's say ask and get into talking with people, what are they doing, what systems are they treating, maybe they encounter the same problems. Yeah. So this is for you, take this chance. Um, another thing is, who of you is using Windows on their computers? These are a few people, yes. Um, who of those still has a 32-bit version of Windows. That's not that many, okay. No, it doesn't count. Um, <laughs> who has a Mac? Oh, this is a few, yeah, right. And who is using Linux? Oh, even more than Macs. That's, that's surprising. Yeah. Okay, that's just that we have a rough idea who is using or account on what platform. Okay, so this was just for the introduction. So let's step into it. Let's say I already said that. I'm going to tell you something about the installation of the ARCA program, using a text editor to specify the calculation details, 
especially the input file, and then running the Orca program. Right? If you already have some contact with the supercomputing center, it might be even in a cluster environment or a batch system, but in principle, these are the steps you always have to follow if you want to start an Orca calculator. As I already said, Orca is available for all popular platforms, meaning at the moment, Windows, macOS, or Linux. Yeah, Orca is distributed as an archive for all platforms. Those who use Windows on their computers, that was already something, let's say, strange. Uh, because usually you want to have on Windows something which is called setup or install, that's it. Uh, with Orca it's somewhat different because you just have an archive and you have to unzip it, extract it somewhere and then tell the system somehow where to find these binaries. And in order to make it easier, I always installed it in a folder which is called Orca. Just to make it easier, you can of course install it somewhere else, but that's the easiest way. Here we go. This is the configuration under Windows 7. Windows 8 is the same actually. And this means this is the part where you tell the computer where to find the Orca. If you remember at the places where I did this on your computer in yesterday in the session, um, this is just a quick, 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 but this is here explained what to actually do. So, in principle, you go from advanced control system to advanced settings. Now, here you get to advanced, and in the advanced settings, you have the environment variables. And here, you can edit the so-called path variable. In the path variable is everything the computer is looking for for programs. Uh, and so if we edit at this place, the computer knows where to find the Orca. And this is exactly what I did yesterday to your computers, if you just wanted. And here in this is also assumed that Orca resides in the Orca. So in principle, you can do control panel, system, advanced system settings, and then set the path variable here. Uh, this way has the disadvantage that you have to have system administrator rights. There's another way, slightly different, if you enter control panel, user accounts and family safety, user accounts again, and then change my environment variables. This can be done by every user on all systems. Uh, but the setting of the path variable here is called path again, and here you put in the CORCA path is the same in both methods. So again, it's assumed that it resides in ORCA. You click OK, then you have to log out and log in again, and then the computer should know where the ORCA resides. OK, then you have installed ORCA on your computer, and the next question usually was, how do I know that it works? The uh, best thing to know that is to write a first input file. And here we see, let's say, the first input file you can generate for Orca. And in order to do that, you have to have something which is called a text editor. Uh, something where you can simply edit simple text files. Especially on Windows, please do not use Word. Word is not a simple text editor. And you might see strange stuff when you try to feed a word output into Orca. Yeah? This might seem easy to a few people, but don't underestimate this. Um, of course, each and every text editor can be used, which are you familiar with. Let's say Notepad, plus plus, whatever. And yeah, a simple Orca input looks like this. Uh, just some magic lines, something which looks like Cartesian coordinates, and you call it some file. And then in order to actually execute Orca with these files, you have to go to the magic icon on Windows, and then in the search line, enter CMD for command. Uh, and this means you try to open a command window, and then upon re pressing return, you will get a window which looks like this. 
And this is the environment usually where all interaction with the ARCA and you as the user takes place. Well, this is somewhat different than your usual um, GUI under Windows where you are used to where's my file, where's my open, where can I click, stuff like that. In ARCA, everything takes place in this command window. Also handy comes the so-called task manager where you can see what's still running on your system. Right? At some point when you have a more difficult calculation, you might wonder, is my computer still doing anything? Uh, so is my computer maybe dead or out of battery or something strange has happened? The task manager can tell you if your calculation is still running. You know? If you don't know how to call the task manager on the Windows 7, you can click on the right mouse button here at the bar and call up the task manager. This is how you do it. This was roughly for Windows. As I said, this was just a rough tour for the installation and for the first text editor input. We will come back to that later, step by step again. Here is the same roughly with the Mac OS system. The steps are exactly the same. Right? Meaning we have to extract the ORCA, set the path variable, edit the input with some text editor, but just in a slightly um, different way. Here in macOS, you will find in utilities, also in the same applications directly, the text edit, where you can edit your text files with. And in the utilities folder, you find the terminal. Well, this is roughly the same equivalent as on Windows, the command window. And in order to tell the system on macOS where to find the ORCA, Either you have to enter this before you start the ORCA in the terminal window or there's a different way which I will show you on the next slide. Otherwise, the execution of the ORCA is exactly the same as on Windows. Here is where you can enter the same line that has been seen here to tell the system where to find the ORCA by introducing this line into the file which is called bashrc or bash profile. In one of these files, if you enter this line, from then on the computer always knows where your ARCA resides. And here you can see the equivalent of the task manager under macOS, which can be found also in the utilities folder, which is called activity monitor and it has exactly the same function as the task manager under Windows, showing all the processes that's running and so on. Here is the text edit shown also with the input that has been shown under Windows. Yeah. Here again, this is the same for Linux. I go something faster with the Linux guys because usually these guys are more familiar with the entering of commands and such. So same again, you have to have a text editor and tell the ORCA where the ORCA can be found. And also, the execution of the ORCA is exactly the same as on macOS and Windows. And what this magic command here means, I'll explain later. So in principle, what you need until now is your ORCA installed in your system, a text editor, and that the system knows where to find the ORCA executable. Now, comes the rough tour through what you can do with ARCA and how. And why is that? Now, ARCA is a, meanwhile, a big software project which is being used worldwide by more than 10,000 users with lots of functionality, methods, and so on, and which can be downloaded for free on this web page. Important thing also is when you get familiar with the ARCA behind this web address, there's a so-called ARCA forum. If you encounter problems with the ORCA, this is the place to go. Don't be afraid to ask questions as dumb as they might seem to you. Just do it. Well, they will be answered. Who of you already knows the ORCA forum? Oh, quite a few already. That's good. As I said, try it. It's worthwhile. Yeah. 
just released was the ARCA 3.0.0 version. 3.0.2 is a bug fix release, and we have lots of exciting new features. I won't go here into the de uh, details. It's just new methods like the DLPMO explicitly correlated, analytical Hessian, and so on, and so on, and so on. If you're already familiar with computational cameras, this means something to you. Otherwise, you will learn about many of the things in the special practicals. The philosophy behind the ARCA project is that it should be as flexible, as efficient, and as comprehensive, and as user-friendly as possible. I think many of you have already used the Gaussian program, which is... <laughs> something. <laughs> um, and there are also other programs which might not be as easy to use, like Gaussian or ARCA. And so, user-friendliness and comprehensive in, are one of the features which are of most prominent form in all time. Anyways, what are the actual tasks we are going to ask from a computational chemistry program? And actually, this is quite um, yeah, easy to see that calculation of single-point energies is one of the most important things, like what we heard in the morning of Hartree-Fock theory, density functional theory, optimization of molecular geometries is the next step that you can calculate equilibrium geometries, transition states and reaction rates, calculation of vibrational frequencies, let's say in order to check if you are really on a minimum structure or if you want to calculate thermodynamic properties, stationary points, vibrational spectra. Other ground state properties are also accessible, like charge distributions, ground spectra, LMR spectra, EPR spectra, Bose power spectra. All of this will be done in the special practicals. And also, of course, excited state properties are also accessible. If you look through the whole list, you will see that energy calculations, geometry optimizations, frequency calculations, transition states, are roughly 90% of all calculations you are going to do. And this is why I'm now going to step through all these few points to give you an inkling how to do them. Okay, first stop, energy calculations. And as I said, an ARCA input has to be somehow generated. And here we see what's behind these magic keywords that are being put into the file. Now, so here is explained, for example, the ARCHI stands for Restricted Core Chum. We have heard in the morning about the different levels of theory you can choose from, and this is one of the magic DFT functional theory styles. Here in the next word, you specify the functional. Here, the basis set, and this is something where you tell the ARCHI I okay, bring me more than I actually want to know. Then, after you have specified the method, you have to tell ARCA what's the molecule, what are you actually going to calculate. And this starts here after the XYZ, after specifying charge and multiplicity. And then come the single atoms line by line in Cartesian coordinates. Yeah. So far, so good. And then if you actually start the calculation, the first you see is a scrolling output of something wired with numbers and stuff like that. And you see here that if you do a single point calculation, the first thing the problem tells you, yes, it's a single point of calculation. It repeats the Cartesian coordinates. Then it tells you about the basis set information. For example, here you see that the uncontracted basis set and the contracted basis set, what that means, I'll tell you later. And here you see the basis set statistics and startup info. This is an important information, like the number of basis functions. You have heard in the morning that the quality of your calculation increases with the size of your basis set. Now, what you actually want to have is an infinite basis, but as you cannot have an infinite basis, you have to stop somewhere. And 
This is actually the value which tells you how large your base set is in this case. Be reminded, if something is here which tells you 5,000, you are in trouble. Yeah? Okay. Well, this means your computer is doing anything you but won't see the end. Okay. What else does the program tell you? Yes, it's a density functional method with an exchange function. We had in the morning that the density functional theory is, has parts in exchange and correlation functionals, meaning here you have an E, A, and exchange, and a correlation functional of loop, which also has an LEA part, and that you have a fractional hard free fog exchange part with the B3 dip functional, and these are the exact coefficients for that. Also, the rough criteria of your calculations are repeated here, meaning the total charge, the multiplicity, the number of electrons, and the basis set. Well, so there you know that the system you specified is exactly as you wanted. Here is, our, here is the DFT grid generation specified, meaning if you do a DFT calculation, there is some part which cannot be integrated analytically, but it's being done numerically on the grid. And of course, the larger your grid size is, the more accurate your calculation becomes. Uh, and this one tells you the number of grid points. The more grid points you have, the more accurate your calculation is. Okay, but this was just to repeat the information which gets into your calculation. The actual calculation starts here. Uh, iteration zero. If you remember the lecture in the morning, Frank said something about, yeah, we start somewhere with a guess and then we calculate the fog operator and then we do in the easiest part the diagonalization and then we repeat it. This is exactly this part. Uh, so from iteration to iteration, you see iteration zero and you see for this iteration the energy and if everything is okay, you will see that the energy decreases, decreases, decreases until the change in energy is zero and then the actual calculation stops with the message of success, SCF converged, calculation ready, well, first success. At the end that is printed total energy and this is actually the energy you want to have. Meaning, at that point, for this system, you know the actual energy of this configuration. Now, and then, in addition, you get, let's say, different energies of the orbitals. We already heard in the morning that orbitals are always something to be aware of, but in the one electron picture, you can say, okay, these orbitals have specific energies. Okay. In addition, there are some, let's say, derived properties. For example, chemists are used to deal with atomic partial charges. Well, if you know, you see a molecule, let's say, the CO or CH4, whatever, you know that the hydrogen is usually partially positive and oxygen negative, and the rest is somewhere in the middle. And the molecular char atomic charges give you exactly that picture. Uh, they tell you, okay, this atom is more negative or more positive, and that you can interpret that in means of chemistry. Luckily for the CO molecules, it's even sum up to zero, meaning the problem is not completely broken. Okay, then the molecular reduced um, orbital charges can be summed up again in some contributions from the different orbitals. And in addition, besides the molecule population, you can also get the Löwdien um, population analysis, which gives you already in the CO molecules different values. This is what I meant with derived properties. There's always a reason why these properties are calculated this way, but they are by no means unique and defined in terms of the Hamiltonian. Uh, so that's why you already see in the CO molecule different signs with the single atoms. 
Yeah, okay, so the molecules in this case is difficult, but be careful with derived properties. Here you also have for the Löwdien orbital population again the energies of the orbitals, the occupation of the orbitals, and here the contributions of the single atomic orbitals. As heard in the morning, your calculation is made in principle up of a linear combination of atomic orbitals, and here you can see what contributes to my molecular orbitals from these different orbitals. Okay. I've been talking a lot about orbitals now. How do we actually look at these orbitals? And for this you can use a program which comes with ORCA, which is called ORCA plot. And if you specify on the command line ORCA plot and input file name dot gbw, here's a b missing, minus e, the program gets into a dialogue with you. Uh, and if you see these so-called um, Stone Age menu, because nowadays you would expect something with a menu where to click, you can press Enter 5 to choose the output formation, and then 4 for the grid interval. To plot an orbital from a closed shell calculation is 3. 2, enter the number of MO you want, and then 10 to enter and to generate the output file. And if everything works as planned, you will get, in the end, a so-called cube file, which can be read by most of the programs which are on the USB stick. Now, so these programs then are used to actually look at these orbitals. And also with the ORCA plot, you can look at different schemes, meaning single orbitals. Be careful, orbitals numbering with ORCA usually starts with zero. And also at something like the total density. Well, this is everything you can do with the ORCA plot. Important, don't forget the minus E. No? And then if you actually want to look at the orbitals, you can do it with ORCA plot and with an XYZ file and whatever program you want to have, like Chimera, Gmolden, Chemcraft, whatever, you can then open the program, file open, you somehow have to get the XYZ coordinates in the program, and then usually there's something where you say, now lad the Gaussian cube format file, which has been produced by the ARCA plot. And one of the things you then have to enter is the ISO level at which these orbitals are being drawn. Meaning, if you have a very, very low value in this case, you just see a large blob. If you have a too high value, you won't see anything. Now, usually the programs nowadays give you a suggested value that you can see something, but you can modify that. Just play around with the value, you get a feeling for it. And then, of course, you can save also these images. Here has been drawn the HOMO of the CO and the LUMO. Just give you an impression that you actually then can look at the orbitals. Okay. Energy calculations make up the simplest computational task. Uh, and there are three things have to be determined before meaning the method, the basis set, and the coordinates. Uh, this you have already seen in the input files, these are the things you have to have before you actually have to, can do a calculation. And also in the morning, Frank said. Artery Fock theory, fast but not accurate enough, and usually only nowadays is a basis for higher level methods. DFT, fast, usually good accuracy, but is it also accurate in my case? And also very dependent on the functional. Correlated wave function based method, very high accuracy, coupled pair theory like coupled cluster and so on, up to chemical accuracy, 
but the calculations get very expensive and time consuming if the system gets larger. We can talk about this still an hour, but usually at this point somebody says, yeah, that's everything okay, but the referee and usually CCSDT is the best. Why not take this right now? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's exactly the problem. Because if you start your calculation with CCSDT, with your normal molecules, you won't see the end. Uh -huh. So it takes so long, even for medium-sized molecules, that it's not feasible. And what you then do, you switch back to DFT, but with the DFT you have the problem, you have a whole zoo of functions to choose. Uh, meaning, Frank also said it, in a month you get five to ten new functionals. Uh, and if you see that, which one do you choose? Uh, there's some uh, rough estimation how to characterize these so-called GGAs. Uh, Belup is one of the oldest ones and then up to the double hybrids, which are fairly used by Stefan Grimmer. In the middle you have these already shown B3 loop, which is a hybrid function with, S, uh, with the Hartree-Fock exchange, but in principle you have no idea which one to choose. Uh, and here we usually say, which is shown on the next few slides, there's a default value for the functionals, which are suggested by us. DFT is also good for a different reason. Frank didn't say anything about the scaling of the method in the morning, but the reason why DFT is in the first place so popular because of the RI approximation. Meaning, if you have a functional like the BP86 and you specify that RI keyword, and in addition to the normal basis set, uh, the so-called auxiliary basis set, the calculation will be much, much faster than if you do a normal hartree fock calculation. This is the reason why DFT is so popular. Specifying the auxiliary basis set, you introduce, of course, an error in your calculation, because nothing is for free. It's an approximation. But in absolute energies, you will notice the error. In relative energies, this is okay, usually. Good. But now, I said, you can use the array approximation only for, let's say, pure functionals. If you are stuck with a B3 loop, until now, this has not been possible to speed these calculations up. But in recent time, our group invented a measure, method which is called Rich plus X, and this one can also speed up the calculation of the hartree fock exchange. And so in these cases, you also have to specify the two basis sets, and here at the Rich plus X, the error JK, which is specified here, is also a way to calculate the hartree fock exchange, but also not with all methods. No? So usually what I suggest is using the rich cost x approximation because then also all gradients for the optimization are available. Okay. Coming back to the question, which function to choose? And always the first thing to do is array BP86 because simple, this is the fastest way. And in combination with the resolution of identity, you have no problem doing medium-sized molecules at say 20, 30, even 40 atoms on your notebook, on a single column. Well, this is why ARI, ARI BP6 is a good combination. If you need a more quantitative result, the thing you need to do is then B3 lib and in order to speed it up with the rich cost x approximation. To keep in mind, as I said, with all DFT methods, the results are usually good. Usually. But, especially if you have chemically more difficult cases, check your results carefully. 
a new placing of the DFT functional zoo are the so-called double hybrids in which in the normal DFT framework wave function improvements are included. Right? In this case, in the B2P loop, you have a part mixed in from Müller placid perturbation theory making your more unreliable DFT method more reliable in case of the wave function method. And the problem here is also, again, this is not for free, you pay the price of the wave function method in this place. Um, it can be combined with the rich cost X, but it will never be as fast as a normal DFT method. In addition, today you have something which is called an empirical van der Waals correction. For example, Frank has shown the example in the morning of the linear LK chain and of the, yeah, of the double cross form. And the normal DFT goes downhill in this example. If you switch on the van der Waals correction in this case, the result should be correct. No, because this is exactly what's missing from the DFT solution that Stefan Grimmel had simply said at that point, okay, if we know this is missing, we just add it in. No, so this is at the moment very popular among DFT. Now we know the method and now we go to the basis set. Again, lots of basis set are known in the literature. Like 6, 3, 1, G, 6, minus 3, 1, G, star, 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 plus, plus, 1, 1, 1, plus, plus, star, star. Equally <coughs> prolonged, whatever. Other basis sets are DCP, TCP, RX SVP, RX TCVP, whatever. Meaning, double theta polarized. Again, computer lingo. Meaning, you have two functions for your valence region and usually one fixed function for your core region. If you remember, your calculation gets more exact with the basis head size. And also we know from chemistry that your normal chemistry takes place in the valence region. So it makes sense to increase the flexibility of your basis set in the valence region to some extent. Right? And this exactly means usually this DCP, TCP, TCVP, whatever, means you increase the basis set size, especially in the valence region. In addition, you have these, so to say, correlation consistent basis sets by Tom Dunning, if you do not know an explicit reason to use them, don't do it. Yeah, you get very bad results in your normal SCF and DFT calculation, and only in very special purposes make sense to use them. Okay, just let me explain briefly what these 6, 3, 1, whatever actually means. It means that in the things before the minus, you have an, so to say, n core, where the core orbitals are represented by fixed contractions of yeah, Gaussian orbitals. And afterwards, the valence region is specified by a contracted function of 3 and 1, meaning two functions. And afterwards, there are usually some dp, meaning polarized function, and the plus plus means even more diffuse function in the outer regions. Huh? So, usually with a so-called total basis set, this is, with the exception of a few ones in between, already as large as you can get. And these are very popular due to the Gaussian programs. Our suggestion is, don't use them. Because the Aldrich space sets are usually much better. So you get for the same amount of computational time better results. Yeah? 
especially these Maldex SVP, TCP are really good in this respect. So, you know which method you have to choose, you know which are the suggested basis sets. What's missing? The coordinates. Now somehow we have to get our molecule to the computer now, somehow. And in principle, all you need is text editor. And not many people can actually imagine a molecule and then for, let's say, 30 atoms, enter the XYZ coordinates. Um, if anybody can do that, talk to me after the talk. Yeah? <laughs> so, what people invented then is the so-called set matrix, where you specify a molecule with respect to internal coordinates. Now, if you talk to somebody, this is roughly the language you use. Now, if you have one atom and another, you talk in, in a sense of distances, and angles between these atoms, and so on. This is roughly what is meant with a set matrix. But even this gets very difficult if the molecule gets larger. Well, for a few atoms, that's fine. For everything else, no. Well, today, molecules are created with full specification in X, Y, Z with programs right here. For example, one of these programs is PyMol. You can use Meanwhile, a whole zoo of programs to do that. You generate some molecule and it spits out some file with x, y, z coordinates. Now, this is then the starting point for your calculation. Now, and how to get these x, y, z coordinates into ARCA? The first thing would be copy the contents of the x, y, z file into the ARCA input or read in the x, y, z file via an ARCA command. Uh, these are the two possibilities we have. The first thing might be somewhat strange, but believe me, if you have ever done 200 calculations and you have to find the coordinate files you specified in these calculations, you know the worth to put in the coordinates into the input file. Uh, but that's up to you. Yeah, this is roughly what I said. And other sources of molecular structures are crystal structures, clear. But you have to be careful because especially in biostructures, these structures are not always complete. No? The first thing usually somebody does if he gets familiar with ARCA, now take some biomolecule out of the PV data bank and let's calculate the energy. Big problem. Doesn't converge. Now, doesn't converge is not the, the real thing, but this is usually to some structural deficit, which is their meaning, usually missing atoms, or just simple broken structures. Or you have NMR structures, and always there are some pre calculated theoretical models in these data banks. Yeah, I already said sooner or later it happens. The SCF cycle does not converge. Might happen if you just put your beautiful, complete DNA into the ARCA and say calculate. <coughs> uh, okay, this might be a problem to converge. Um, what then? Check the structure for errors. That's already what I said. Very large systems might also have the problem that you accumulate numerical noise in your calculation. Uh, we have already seen that the final energy is an addition of very large numbers. And of course you accumulate noise there. Or you might have difficult chemical bonding. This might also be a reason why your system does not converge, especially if you are treating transition metals, this might be more the standard than the exception. Okay, what to do then? You have to influence the convergence somehow. You can do damping, level shift, DIS, SOSF. 
This is beautiful in quantum chemistry. Eh? You just throw in a few acronyms and then people should accept it. Yeah, that's exactly what we do here. Um, <laughs> because of Constant Ocker is more clever, we have a few more. Um, you can specify a nice combination of all this stuff with one word, which is just called slow conf. Uh, so if you ever run into trouble with your convergence, the first thing you do is specify slow conf. Uh, so then you get a whole combination of these things switched on, which are all explained in the manual and have a very specific meaning. But this should give your calculation more probability to converge. Uh, otherwise, there's no way around playing with these values yourself. As I said, everything documented in the Orca manual. Orca manual, important. Transition metal calculations. Open-shell transition metals are really, if you have ever done it or not done it, one of the most difficult systems to converge. And here you see a specification of what I just said. Just specify the slow conf or play around with the values yourself. Skip this for now and all the details. Stay with the slow conf. Uh, if your calculation difficult to converge, slow conf. Uh, slow conf. Okay. Um, Restarting calculations. At some point, the calculations might take very long. What then? You do not want to do the already converged calculation again and again if you, let's say, just want to have a Mullican population analysis or want to have some uh, additional wave function analysis on top of that. So you just want to read the orbitals you already calculated in the prior runs. And this you do by specifying MO read here in the one-liner and in addition with a percentage sign, the MO in GBW file then afterwards. Everything your computer has been done is always in the GBW, the GBW file. GBW means geometry, basis set, wave function. Uh, so everything that has been calculated is always in this file and here at that point it just means read it in to the archive at this point and use it then for the further calculation. Uh, okay. This was all for single energy calculations. Next step you usually want to have is a minimum structure. If you took a molecule, let's say, out of a crystal structure database or you generate it yourself, this is usually not the energetic minimum. And from a formal point of view, a geometry, geometry optimization minimizes the overall energy of the system by changing the atomic coordinates. This just means it is also a iterative process from step to step where the gradient is calculated at all points and then hopefully the energy gets lower and lower and at some point you are at a minimum with respect to all coordinates and you're happy. Huh? The problem is that usually leads you only to the nearest minimum and not to the global minimum. The more degrees of freedom your system has this might be a serious problem. Again, your chemical intuition is asked for here. And if you start at a point where you know you are far from the global minimum, you will never reach it. Things to keep in mind when doing geometry optimizations. The SCF function, meaning the energy you calculated at the points, might not be very accurate. Also, when you calculate the energy, you get something like this. 
if you really want to follow the gradient and you get something like this, it might be difficult. Right? You would rather have something which is continuously falling. And so you have to make sure that the SCF function is as smooth as possible. Then, also the geometry optimization might be tough to converge if your molecule is very sloppy. Uh, meaning, if you have, let's say, a ring and some alkyl chain at a ring, which is very soft, meaning the energy changes are uh, very small respect to changes in the geometry. Uh, that's also difficult. And so these are the things to keep in mind if you actually do the geometry optimization. Optimizations are just done by specifying the keyword opt. Uh, so all you have to do is say opt and Orca will do the rest. And then in contrast to the single point calculations you will see Orca geometry relaxation step, meaning the program takes step in the geometry to lower the energy. And at some point, hopefully, it's printing geometry convergence 0, 0, 0, and at some point, hooray. Now, so if you then go through the output and look for the hooray, afterwards you will see the structure coordinates of the optimized structure. What you can also do are so-called constraints and relaxed scans. You might have a molecular structure where you say, mm, no, actually I want specific internal coordinates fixed. Or let's say I want to scan a path where I only scan the other coordinates which are not on the path. And this you can do with so-called constraints in the program, meaning you specify a geom block with constraints and here is a bond frozen or an angle frozen and afterwards everything except these coordinates are being optimized. These are frozen at a specific point. This might be useful in certain cases. And then another plaything is here that you only want to use hydrogens. Okay, these are Geometry optimization, the next step would be frequency calculations. Frequencies, what? Um, behind these frequency calculations are quite a few useful things. From formal point of view, it means the calculation of the mass weighted Hessian matrix, that means the second derivative of the energy with respect to all coordinates. And by using the values up on the organization, we get the frequencies. Uh, but that's not all we get out of this meeting. Not only the calculation of the frequencies and the harmonic approximation and the intensities, but we can also check the molecules, let's say, for any, did we end up on a transition state at the end of a geometry optimization. Uh, meaning, let's say, we walked here at this path and to check if we did not end up, let's say, here. Uh, and this can also be done with a frequency analysis and then you would see that the exception of one, which is extra maximum, meaning one is negative. Yeah, exactly one negative frequency, it's unexpected. And also from a Frequency analysis, you would get a zero point energy. You know that from physical chemistry that even at zero Kelvin, your molecule vibrates no, with a zero point energy. And if you really want to calculate not, not the only electronic energy, but to some extent the real energy of the molecule, you have to, account, to take account this one. And this is done automatically by the program if you specify the frequency analysis. Okay, as I said, doing the harmonic frequencies are done for a lot of reasons, for stationary points, predicting vibration and spectra, and also thermodynamic properties. In the Barker input, this is just specified by specifying NUMFRAC 
R and the newer versions of R cut by frac. Uh, but in the end, what you always get are these properties which have been mentioned on the slides before. Here is an output of those. Again, as I said, Orca usually, for as a good program usually does, starts at zero, uh, meaning for a nonlinear molecule you get the first six by zero, and then you get the frequencies afterwards for the different modes. Also, the IR spectrum with the intensities are printed out, and you can also plot the IR spectrum with the help of the ORCA Web SPC program. Another thing which is important, we have been only talking up to now about yeah, molecules in vacuum. Uh, usually, but especially if you calculate ions, you usually do not want to do that because you artificially raise the energy. And for this, there have been invented so-called implicit solvation models. And in ORCA, the one that is implemented is the so-called conductor-like screening model by Andreas Klant. In order to do this, you just have to specify COSMO and then the, the solvent, and that's it. Now, in principle, if you want to do excited states, there are additional things to specify. But in principle, you just have to specify Cosmo water. Yeah. So, at this place, we end our rough tour through 90% of the yeah, usually done calculations. And now I would ask you take out your notebooks and try to enter the following stuff yourself so that you can already see if your setup is working and also follow the weird stuff I have been explaining before. Yeah? So, every notebook's already up. Looks good. second ARCA job. Before it was CO, now we make a big step forward and we are going now to water. So try to open a text editor in your computer on your system and enter this small water molecule. You see here at this point that the we just start with an arbitrary conformation of water, in this case, no, no, why not linear water? And as I have said, the ARCA can optimize this structure by itself, which we can see here with the opt keyword. No, otherwise, I have already said what we need is a method, a basis, and a structure. Here we can see the method, meaning restricted constant density functional theory, and the functional in this case b 3 lib and the basis set is the SVP, which is the Alrichs SVP I already mentioned, we always use. So, Everybody finished with entering the water molecule? <laughs> that was a clear yeah in me. <laughs> so, who has finished the water molecule? Yeah, we have a strange left to right. <laughs> what certificate here with the water?
So if you have entered the portal system, you save it in a file, let's call water.in or first.in and be careful to see where the computer stores it. Sometimes it's not easy to find where the computer has actually stored the output. Okay. 